1969, for the first time, a man has landed on the moon. Step off the limb, now. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Millions of people heard astronaut Neil Armstrong utter those famous words when he stepped on the moon. This was an event which marked 1969 as a year when science and technology attained one of their greatest triumphs. For us here in Norway, something else happened that same year. Something which did very much to strengthen the impression that modern research and technology in many fields could extend boundaries far beyond those we previously had considered possible. Here, in the middle of the North Sea, in one of the world's worst areas of weather, we found vast quantities of oil and gas buried deep under the seafloor. Exploring the geological strata beneath the seafloor, using sophisticated electronics and special vessels, began early in the 1960s. Results showed the presence of promising geological structures beneath the floor of the sea. Was oil and gas trapped in any of these? Only drilling could tell. The probing began in deeper water and stormier seas than had ever been tried before. Men and machinery were pushed to their ultimate strength. And it seemed that the effort was in vain as one dry hole followed another until the number of dry holes drilled by the companies exploring the North Sea added up to 33. The Phillips Norway group had found gas and condensate in one well, but further drilling showed that it was not large enough to develop by itself. It looked as though the promise of the North Sea was an empty one. And in an atmosphere of doubt and disappointment, the Phillips Norway group committed to drill an exploratory well on the structure codenamed Ecofisk in the Norwegian sector. Drilling was over a mile deep when pressure in the hole suddenly increased. The combination of high pressure and winter storms forced abandonment of the well. It seemed that something unusual was down there, perhaps something good since there were traces of oil in the cuttings from the high pressure zone. After the well was abandoned, it was decided to drill another hole about six tenths of a mile away when spring came. That well was almost two miles deep and nothing had been found when samples began coming to the top that were oozing oil and gas. The Ecofisk Discovery Well had finally found the hidden riches of the North Sea. The oil and gas discovered in the Ecofisk field started a brand new industry, an industry which would have a major effect over the whole country, especially in the small port at Stavanger, soon to become the center for oil activities on the Norwegian continental shelf. Here, the Phillips Group built their headquarters, and later, several other oil companies followed. The old fishing port and trading center gradually changed its character. Soon people began to realize that this was a very big undertaking. It was an enormous planning job to be done before the actual building could begin. And there were very few who at that time completely understood what was required to develop the Ecofisk field. And they didn't have a good idea what the first commercial oil and gas field in the North Sea would mean for Stavanger and for Norway. The first important decision of the Phillips Group then was to convert the drilling platform Gulf Tide into a production platform. The struggle continued with the turbulent elements that guarded these North Sea resources. It wasn't easy building the first subsea well hookups. 
loading buoys, and tanker mooring installations. It was the first time for all of these in conditions like those the North Sea forced upon the builders. Sometimes the wind and the waves seemed endless, forcing the work to stop. But despite interruptions, progress was made and the tasks were done. The difficult and the impossible had yielded to ingenuity and determination. Loading lines were finally filled with oil from the North Sea. Less than 18 months after the Ekafisk was discovered, production started. Norway had become an oil country for real. And the importance of this was underscored when the Prime Minister at that time, Trygve Bratli, made an official visit to Gulf Tide. The carefully planned system was carried out in reality, piece by piece and day by day. Plans worked. Oil continued to flow from Ecofisk in spite of frequent storm shutdowns. Eventually, everything was ready for further development of the field. The world's largest concrete storage tank was being built in Stavanger Harbor to furnish a place to store the oil during storms. Components of the final Ecofisk complex were built at many places around the world and brought together after traveling thousands of miles and hundreds of days, all to be in the right place at the right time. The plan for producing the oil and gas from the main Ecofisk field called for 30 production wells and eight wells for gas reinjection at a pressure of almost 10,000 pounds per square inch. During the next phase of the development, pipelines will be built to carry the oil and gas from Ecofisk to land. With further development of Ecofisk in the outlying fields, the tank will be used as a base and foundation for the field's production and control facilities. Little by little, the tank is changed to become the center of the Ecofisk complex. In the spring of 1974, Ecofisk Center was joined to the rest of the platforms by catwalks and pipe bridges. It didn't all go smoothly. During an operation of this kind, you have to have steel nerves and be willing to take risks which don't always turn out right. A sad sight for a builder, but it can be fixed. There were problems from time to time, and a few accidents. There is no reason to hide this, but we should remember that nothing like this had ever been done before under such very difficult conditions. Whenever the workers managed, in spite of it all, to get the construction jobs done out here, it was because everyone became involved. It was a kind of a pioneer spirit that prevailed. A person just wouldn't give up, even when it seemed very, very difficult to go on. It cost six weeks to repair the damage, but fixed it was. And now it's possible to walk almost a mile from one flare to the other. One of the first to take this walk, high above the sea, was the King of Norway, Olaf V, who visited Ecofisk when it was almost finished. The only way to efficiently move the oil and gas from the Ecofisk complex when full production was attained was through pipelines, a 34-inch oil pipeline running 220 miles from Ecofisk to Teesside, England, and a 36-inch gas pipeline running 275 miles to Emden, West Germany. On board the pipe-laying barges, the links of pipe are welded together as the pipelines are laid. This was the biggest and most extensive pipeline job ever undertaken offshore. And to accomplish this, 
The Philips Group entered into a joint venture with Start Oil, the Norwegian State Oil Company, and they created a new company called Norpipe. It's this company that owns the pipelines and is responsible for seeing to it that the transport system works. Philips Petroleum Company in Norway was assigned to construct and operate the pipelines. Special equipment was used to dig a trench for the pipe in the sea floor. Underwater sleds were pulled along the pipeline route using powerful jets of water to cut a ditch. The pipe was then lowered into place. Seafloor currents would soon cover it with silt and sand. When the weather got too rough, the pipeline was lowered to the seabed until the weather moderated, when it was raised again and the work of pipe laying continued. To maintain smooth flow and even pressures, two booster stations were built for each pipeline. To keep the pipelines clean, mechanical cleaners called pigs are periodically driven through. The pigs are received at the booster stations where they are cleaned before continuing the journey to Teesside or Emden. The crude oil from Ecofisk arrives at sealed sands near Teesside, where four reception spheres, each holding 45,000 barrels, provide preliminary storage. Then the crude is pumped to the stabilization plant for removal of the natural gas liquids. The stabilized crude is stored at the Gretham Tank Farm. At Teesside, the harbor has facilities to load tankers of as much as 150,000 tons dead weight. The inauguration of the Teesside facilities took place in 1975. My lord, honored guest, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Norpipe AS and Norpipe Petroleum UK Limited, I bid you welcome. This is an historical and important day. The Teesside Oil Terminal is not an oil refinery, but rather a crude oil reception, processing, storage, and transshipment installation. The plant is the largest of its kind in the world. Operating at full capacity, it can handle nearly half as much oil in a day as is currently consumed in the whole of the United Kingdom. This is near Emden in northwest Germany, a peaceful pastoral stretch of country where life proceeds at a leisurely pace. And where horsepower still means what it says. Fishing has long provided a natural source of livelihood, but few expected the arrival of enormous quantities of natural gas from the North Sea. The gas pipeline comes ashore here at Emden. Keeping the environment undisturbed here, as well as at Teesside, took a lot of money, time, and ingenuity. Great care was exercised to remove all possible signs of pipeline construction, and today, it is impossible to guess that a major construction effort was carried out here. Laying almost 20 miles of pipeline across the sand dunes involved moving five or six million cubic meters of sand and mud so the pipeline could be securely bedded and then completely covered over. The gas treating plant was built on a belt of reclaimed land. 
It took a lot of preparation to make it suitable for the equipment. 3,000 pilings had to be driven in to support the heavy steel treaters. A large pumping station was used during construction to keep groundwater out of the many excavations. Working conditions were very poor during construction due to wind, rain, and the constantly blowing sand. But the job was accomplished and done well. The huge quantities of gas which will pass through this plant, designed to handle two billion cubic feet per day, required unusual dimensions, as you can see. This is one of the largest plants of its kind in the world. In the presence of representatives of both Norway and Germany, the Emden plant opened in September 1977. The delivery of natural gas from Ecclefisk to Emden is the culmination of a long and difficult task. Every part of the Emden plant, large and small, has been built to the most modern specifications. Efficiency and reliability were the objectives because those using this gas from the North Sea depend on this fuel. The most important control elements of the plant are duplicated, which means that processing can continue without interruption if an element should fail. From Emden, Ecofisk gas is sold to four of Europe's largest gas suppliers. These distribution companies built their own pipelines from the terminal to receiver stations in the Ruhr, Holland, Belgium, and France. Development of the Ecofisk area goes on with link-ups, first for the satellite field West Ecofisk, later COD, TOR, and other outlying fields. Activity in the area is intense, and the workers' efficiency is high. On April 22, 1977, well number 14 on the Bravo platform blew out of control during a workover. When the first quick work failed to stem the flow, the 112 workers on the platform abandoned it during the night and reached safety in their rescue capsules. Yes, it's Experts from the United States quickly arrived to cap the well. There's not much working room if it, you know, if it did flash. So, uh... Uh, it, it took a lot of time. Of course, we were working in uh, some of the worst of conditions, and just pouring all over. You couldn't look up. You're just all over. Well, you've seen most of the boys that was working up there, their eyes. And, and then, of course, you had to contend with the noise. An early attempt seemed to close in the well, but... have to try something else. We modified some rounds. We, we used various uh, types. Some are sheer rounds and some are just plain blind rounds. And on Saturday, April 30th, the well was successfully capped and the Red Adair Company teams received congratulations. You can understand the great relief everyone felt when the researchers finally could report that the Bravo blowout hadn't damaged the life in the sea. But many here in Norway felt that this was a close call. 
And even greater efforts were made to achieve safety on the Wheatson oil platforms. In late 1977, after years of planning, the Sedco Phillips SS arrived in Stavanger. This is the world's first specially constructed semi-submersible utility and emergency vessel. The vessel's firefighting capacity, 160,000 liters per minute, is equivalent to 150 firemen at work simultaneously. With the commissioning of this vessel in the Ecofisk area, a new and significant chapter was added to the Norwegian and international oil industry. At the Ecofisk Central Complex, the foundation has been laid for another addition, a housing platform which will help make life in the North Sea more tolerable for the workers. It also is a massive undertaking. Summer and autumn of 1977, work goes on day and night, including a bridge to link the housing platform to the rest of the Ecofisk Central Complex. The barge carrying the module for the living quarters arrived at Ecofisk late in 1977. A brief period of fine weather enabled the construction crews to cut loose the sea fastenings. And the enormous six story high modules were hoisted in place on the cellar deck one by one. Coaster. Do you have a cabin for me? Uh, yeah, 103. It's in the first floor. First floor. Here's a deck of these kids. Yes, of course, naturally you can hear me clearly. Good communication is an absolute necessity when you work in the middle of the North Sea. An Earth satellite suspended almost 22,000 miles above the equator is providing a reliable means of communications between Norway and Ecofisk. In 1981, the jacket of a new platform was carefully hoisted into place at Ecofisk. This is a G-Riser platform receiving oil and gas production from the Valhall field. There are now a total of 23 permanent structures or platforms in the Ecofisk area fields. Eleven are on the Ecofisk field itself, and the other 12 are spread on different satellite fields. Elfisk, Edda. And here, the oil and gas production from all seven fields is controlled and coordinated, and production is expected to continue into the next century. To increase and prolong production, various methods are constantly being studied. One project, called secondary recovery, pumps water under high pressure into the reservoir to displace and release more oil and gas. This could greatly increase the total production from Ecofisk. As the focal point in the development plan for several smaller fields, Ecofisk is important. For example, oil and gas from Valhall come here via the G platform for distribution to Teesside in Emden. 
Gas from the stat pipe transportation system will go through purification and pressure buildup at Echo Fisk before entering the pipeline to Emden. Furthermore, development of marginal fields may become economically feasible primarily because facilities for processing and distribution already are in place at Ecofisk. When designing the platforms, engineers made an intensive study of North Sea weather patterns before determining that each permanent platform must be built to withstand waves up to 78 feet high, almost the height of an eight-story building and winds up to 130 miles an hour. During a fierce storm in the spring of 1980, the floating quarters platform, Alexander Keeland, which was stationed at the Edda field, capsized. Of the 212 people on board, only 89 were saved. For all of those working or concerned with the North Sea oil fields, this was an experience which has left deep marks. Safety is the prime consideration of everyone who works offshore in the Ecofisk area fields. This should be the case for any person, whether he or she works in an office, a factory, on a farm, or at home. But here at Ecofisk, in the middle of the North Sea, safety is indisputably first. One of the most impressive aspects of the Ecofisk development has been the number of people who have been involved, as many as 15,000. And it all cost, including the processing facilities at Teesside and the Emden gas treating plant, close to $6 billion. We're at the Philips headquarters in Tananger, just a little outside Stavanger. About 700 people work here. And their main job is to support the production at Ecofisk, and in that way to see to it that Norway gets the oil income which is so important to us all. <laughs> the intention of this presentation has been to show you how Norway's first big oil and gas fields were developed, and how this development made it possible for today's offshore industry to take a giant step forward, particularly in regard to using new technology, new equipment, and new ideas. So many thanks for your attention. I sincerely hope you enjoyed the story of Ecofisk.